Ben Stein. I'm the product manager for Secret Veterinary Health. And today we have uh, the first of our Secret webinar series events titled The Oxygen Revolution, Hyperbaric Medicine for Veterinary Patients. Um, we're excited to have Dr. Robert Hancock um, give a talk here on the world of hyperbarics. Hopefully you guys will learn a lot out of it. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, Dr. Hancock will be speaking for approximately about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. So if anybody has any questions for us, uh, feel free to type them in on the chat bar there, and we'll try to get them at the end of the talk. Uh, additionally, this event is a uh, race certified CE event. So with that being said, the marketing team, which is myself, will be sending you a uh, certificate of attendance so that you guys can uh, get credit for this. And I'll send that directly to the email that's on your registration. So that's basically it. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in uh, with Dr. Hancock so that he can give the talk and then we'll open up for questions later on. All right, Dr. Hancock, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Ryan. Well, I, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to promote is is hyperbaric medicine in in our veterinary patients. And the the truth of the matter is is that most of us have not been uh, exposed to this in vet school or in our education. It's really been the last five years that we've seen this kind of come come to be in veterinary medicine so tonight what i really want to focus on is just just some of the hyperbaric basics okay the a little bit of the history a little bit about what we're doing this is not something new this is uh, uh not a new modality this is something that's been around for over 350 years so this is something that has evolved in and really in the last 10 years we've really begun to understand how hyperbarics can help not only human patients, but, but veterinary patients as well. So I'll tell you guys that uh, when I first heard about hyperbarics, all I could think about was that picture from the National Enquirer where you literally saw pictures of, uh, you know, Michael Jackson sitting in his hyperbaric chamber. And, and for me, I just thought of it as this eccentric thing, this, you know, this is a way people promote longevity and, and you know, really didn't know anything about the science behind it or not. And so when I first got into this, I, I won't lie to anybody, I was extremely skeptical. I'm a surgeon, um, the proof is in the pudding, uh, I needed to uh, really see how this was going to affect my patients. And it wasn't until we kind of got started in this and slowly kind of eased into it that I realized what an impact that it would have on my, my surgery patients. And I mean, that's what I do every day. My practice is a surgery referral center. All we do is surgery all day long. Probably 80% of it is orthopedics and neurosurgical. And we've seen such an improvement in our patients' outcomes since incorporating this into the piece of the puzzle um, that it's it's just been a game changer for our practice and, and our clients love it they ask for it they see improvements in their their dogs and cats from when they didn't have it before um, so i i think the the benefits are really there i would never ever try to make a claim that this is a silver bullet that it's a cure-all it's, it's not. It's, it's a piece of the puzzle, just like we would use anything. And I truly believe in a, a total wellness approach to how we, we come at our patients. So we're talking about, you know, a consult with the, the, the owner itself, the surgery itself, the pain management afterwards, hyperbarics in, in the process, rehabilitation, class four laser. I mean, all of these are a part of the, the puzzle that gives us a complete treatment of our patient. So I just wanted everyone to really kind of understand how I approach it and how I look at it. So, like I said, this has been around for 350 years and I'm not going to go in depth into the, the history, but, you know, it goes all the way back to Alexander uh, uh, or uh, back in the, in the Egyptian days with divers looking for sunken treasure and they would actually have these diving bells and uh, Alexander the Great was one of the, the, the ones that supposedly went down into a diving bell initially. But it really in, in uh, 1877, uh, Dr. Fontaine actually had a traveling 
surgery practice. And so he would put his patients in there. And of course, they would use these bellows to pump air into the surgery chamber itself, which then would kind of uh, the patients would report kind of this euphoria and this ability to feel really good as they uh, awoke from from their anesthesia. And more than likely, what was happening is they were pumping room air into this and and people were actually having a nitrogen narcosis from ha breathing so much nitrogen all at once. But, um, you know, again, using pressure for medical reasons was something early on that we saw. And then in, in just shortly after World War One, Drager noticed that uh, when people had diving accidents, um, he developed his first chamber. And interestingly, it never really went anywhere. Um, it was actually uh, Dr. Cunningham in the 1930s that really kind of came to the forefront. He was treating some of his students with uh, Spanish influenza, and he noticed that when he treated these patients in his chamber, uh, a lot of them, their signs got better and they felt better. And ultimately, he actually develops this, this really large, uh, they called it the hyperbaric hotel, and uh, it had rooms just like any other hotel, and it would actually pressurize, and people would come from from all over to be treated in that. Interestingly, when he built this one, it wasn't long after that the Great Depression occurred, and they literally had to scrap the whole thing for for uh, you know sheet metal and free metal. So uh, it was it was kind of a bust for them at that time, just kind of bad timing on everything. In 1960, there was a great study done by Borima. If you go on YouTube, you you can you can see the video. He, he did a, a study and they named it Life Without Blood. And essentially what they did was they removed pig's blood completely, all of their, their blood volume, and they replaced it with, with saline. And then they, they put these guys in at uh, 3 ATA under pressure with hyperbaric oxygen. And they were able to show that these pigs were able to function and live with absolutely zero blood um, because they had so much oxygen pushed into uh, the, the saline and the plasma that was keeping them alive. And then in the end, they actually reinfused the pigs with their blood and they went on and lived a happy life. But the point was, is that we could push enough oxygen actually into the blood plasma that we could keep these animals uh, or, or people or pigs or whatever alive in the process. There are essentially three types of chambers. Uh, class A and class B are both human chambers. Um, the class A is a, a multi-place chamber. So this is a chamber that multiple people can go into. These are about a million dollars or more. Um, typically, you're going to find them in hospitals, and they can treat patients because uh, they basically put a hood on that's airtight, that they breathe 100% oxygen in, and then the actual chamber itself is, is pressurized with air. So it allows them to treat multiple people. It's also got a little bit more, um, it's a little bit safer for, for the patients just because they're not pressurizing with 100% oxygen. And then what we all know and recognize is kind of the typical for people. Class B is a, a human monoplace chamber. This is a chamber that is pressurized directly with 100% oxygen when the patient goes into it. So obviously there's a lot of uh, safety issues that go into uh, each patient that gets treated in that. They have to look for any type of fire hazards or uh, you know, especially in people, they like to wear their Apple watches or their iPhones and all of those electronic things can't go into a chamber that's got 100% oxygen. So they have very strict go, no-go lists for human pe uh, patients. And it's not as much of an issue for us in dogs, but we still have to be very careful about uh, some of the things that will uh, go into the chamber with, with an animal patient. Now, what we use um, is, is what we call a Class C. It's an animal chamber. Uh, there's a couple out there on the market right now. This happens to be C. Chris chamber. This is the smaller chamber, and then they actually have uh, a large full-size chamber that you can treat you know, larger patients, uh, more patients at once. And Class C are specifically for animals. So people are not supposed to go in these chambers. Um, they are supposed to be only used for people. Now, realize that this animal chamber is the exact same as the chamber that you saw. It's had a few modifications uh, specifically for animals, but truthfully, it's, it's actually just uh, a, a human chamber that has been changed into and modified to, to work on veterinary patients. 
So everybody knows what the Benz is, and I always, uh, or at least I think most people know what the Benz is, or they have at least heard of it. Um, if you're a diver, you've heard of Benz, but the, the Benz would actually occur a lot of times in divers where uh, nitrogen builds up in the blood, and if they come up too fast, those little nitrogen bubbles can form big bubbles, and they can cause a whole list of issues, any from air embolism to joint pain. And interestingly, even before the whole diving thing, a lot of it came from what they call caissons disease. And caissons were these huge, basically, boxes that they sank uh, when they were building the, the Brooklyn Bridge and still today. And those bridges would essentially pump air down into and pressurize the bottom of that box. It'd keep the water away so that the guys could could get all the muck and dirt out of the way so that they could have a good foundation for their for their bridges. And what would happen is these guys would come up at the end of the day after working down there in pressurized air. And as they came up fairly quickly, they would complain of joint pain, back pain, confusion, cognitive abnormalities. And what's, it's not funny, but what a lot of the, 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 uh, the guys that were the foremen, they always just thought the, some of these guys were drunk, that they'd been out drinking all night because of the confusion and delirium that they had. But what it really was was bubbles that had gone up into the brain and caused confusion. Now, the interesting thing about that is when the workers would go back down for the day and they would become pressurized again, the signs would go away and they would get better. So eventually they recognized uh, what they call the bends, uh, that they would develop this uh, joint pain or, or bubbles in the joint. And that's kind of where that originated from. There are uh, a few gas laws that you need to understand when we're talking about uh, hyperbaric medicine. Um, and it's, it's not, uh, you know, important to be able to do all the math and all that stuff, but you do need to understand the concepts of how these work. And Boyle's Law is a really important one. It says that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So as we add more pressure, the volume will go down, okay? So if you put a balloon in a hyperbaric chamber, as that air begins to pressurize, that balloon will get smaller and vice versa. OK, it's one of the, the reasons why hyperbaric oxygen helps divers with the bends, because it shrinks those bubbles and allows them to, to off gas and, and not have problems with joint pain and, and embolism and things like that. You also need to understand Henry's law and Henry's law is very simple. I like to think I like this picture because it's got a Coke. And basically what it says is that the higher the pressure that you have a gas in, the more gas will go into that solution. Well, this is, this is really kind of the main concept for hyperbarics. If we put people or animals under pressure with 100% oxygen, we're able to push more oxygen into the plasma so that the body can carry it. Um, so again, higher pressure, more gas goes into solution. Grams is also a very important one when you think about uh, a wound that doesn't have a good blood supply, okay? Oxygen, which is what we're talking about here, it likes to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. So if we really build up the concentration or the partial pressure of oxygen in the bloodstream, as it gets to those areas where they've been wounded or there's not a good blood supply, that oxygen has a gradient. It wants to pull that oxygen off to those tissues. And that's one of the ways that we benefit, especially uh, if you think about wounds like a diabetic foot ulcer that doesn't have a good blow, uh, blood flow or it doesn't have a good uh, partial pressure of oxygen in those wounds, that's where the gradient factor becomes extremely important. So going back to the bins, and if we do have any divers that are here, um, you know, basically when these guys dive, there are specific tables that they have to follow. But if they go down and they dive, that nitrogen accumulates in the bloodstream. And if they come up too fast, again, those bubbles are able to increase in size because they're not under pressure. They can go to the brain. They can go to the heart. They can cause joint pain, skin rashes, all these different things. So for divers, they actually have to have periodic stops um, as they come up from driving to allow some of that nitrogen to off gas and breathe it off. Um, where this becomes an issue for a lot of divers is 
especially young divers or somebody that hasn't done a lot of diving, uh, they see a shark or they see, a, you know, a big marine animal and they get scared and they just, they bolt and they don't think about uh, the fact that they need to, to come up very quickly. And there's, there's literally reports of divers coming up, taking off their mask and going, man, that was an awesome dive and then dropping dead because of the air embolism that occurs. So it can happen that, that quickly. And it's, it's, it is very, very important um, that these guys follow the dive tables very carefully as they go through with their, their diving expedition. This is a great story. I like it because it's a local story. Uh, this is Ray Parrish. And basically Ray Parrish is a, a commercial diver. He'd been doing it for years and years. I think he was like a 30 year veteran. He was uh, behind uh, Ottoman Zoo right out of City Park in New Orleans. And they were trying to salvage a tugboat. And to, to salvage these tugboats, the guys dive down usually somewhere around 80 feet. And they have these huge dredges and they, they suck all this sand and silt from the river off and then that blows out but these dredges are literally like 1000 horsepower uh pumps and with ray something happened we don't really know he doesn't really know or remember but he got sucked into the dredge head first and he lost his mask and his diving equipment he went underwent immediate decompression and he also had his, his whole head sucked by this dredge um, and literally went without oxygen for almost 25 minutes. Um, they brought him up to the surface. Most of these commercial diving units have a hyperbaric chamber there for safety reasons, just in case. When he came up, the head was so deformed by all of the suction on the face and the swelling that had occurred that they really couldn't make out where his mouth or his nose was. It was, you know, kind of like a pumpkin head, swollen tissues. And they really didn't, they couldn't intubate him. They couldn't do anything like that. So they literally just put an oxygen mask over his face where they thought his nose and his mouth was. They put him in a hyperbaric chamber. They took him down to almost six ATA, which is, is very deep. But interestingly, they, they put a tender in with him and a tender is just essentially um, someone to kind of manage him and make sure he's okay while he's in there. Well, what they didn't realize is that the, the mask itself was not really fitted well over the face. And while he was getting some oxygen through it, a lot of it was leaking out and coming out very rapidly into the chamber. And at 6 ATA, it doesn't take very long to have uh, an oxygen seizure. And the tender actually had an oxygen seizure. And what was crazy is, is Ray Parrish actually became alert enough that he was able, able to console this tender that was having a seizure. And anyway, Ray, the, the story is pretty amazing. He underwent a whole block of, of hyperbaric treatments. To this day, after 25 minutes, he has no cognitive dysfunction. Um, he, he still works and does everything normally. He doesn't have any setbacks in terms of his is uh, cerebral ischemia there. So pretty amazing story. And again, I think probably the case for these, why these are so uh, amazing is because they're treated early. And that's one of the biggest fallbacks in, in human medicine is that a lot of the cases that they're treating, they're treating very late in the disease. You have a stroke, you go to stroke rehab, it's probably three months later, and then they want to do, you know, hyperbaric treatments to see if they can help your brain injury, where in reality, treating that brain injury, that initial stroke, that initial ischemic event to the brain should be done almost immediately. Um, same thing with heart attacks. In fact, there's a new device for heart attacks that just came out that basically mimics what hyperbaric oxygen does. And it's it's been uh, approved for uh, by the FDA that you know, to, to prevent some of the reperfusion injury and ischemia that occurs in the heart, they can actually induce that. I actually uh, put an article on the, the veterinary forum page about that if anybody's interested in reading about it. But the point is, is the more acutely we treat these patients, the better the outcome's gonna be. And that's definitely what I have seen in practice. And I think that's really where the big difference is for veterinarians versus human, is we don't have the restrictions of 
insurance and those type of things. And we can actually treat these guys as soon as they come in, um, whether that be stroke victims, whether that be head traumas, spinal cord injuries, whatever the case might be. But acute treatment is really the key. And I think that's where we're going to see as, as we do more veterinary studies, where we're going to see the biggest difference. So we talk about bubbles and, you know, in a hospital setting, bubbles from an IV or, or in, in the human side when they do cardiac bypass is a big issue with bubbles or small air bubbles getting in through the IV lines or through the bypass. And it's actually a very recognizable condition in people that uh, a lot of these folks, after they've had a cabbage procedure or a major bypass, that they'll actually have some cognitive def uh, abnormalities, dysfunction, uh, you know, several weeks after. And it's believed that those th that occurs from the bubbles that come in through the IV line. So there was actually a nice study where they looked at pre-treating these bypass patients before they went on bypass. And they actually found that the level of cognitive uh, dysfunction went down to normal in the patients that were treated. They didn't have it while they saw about 30 or 40 percent of the patients that didn't have it uh, develop these these long term uh, cognitive abnormalities. So, again, from from our perspective, when I do surgery every day, I still have to worry about the potential for bubbles and IV lines during just normal anesthesia process. And we do a lot of preconditioning hyperbaric. So we're actually treating those guys before and after uh, their, their surgical procedure. And, you know, I, I, again, it's hard to assess cognitive function in dogs, but I do have to think that there's probably some, some protective effects from anesthesia when we do treat these guys preoperatively, especially within that four hour window uh, prior to an anesthesia. So again, I, you know, I, we talked about this earlier. I, I don't believe HBOT is a silver bullet. It is a great piece of the puzzle, but it's, it's complimentary. We're gonna put it with our standard treatments. I'm not advocating that we replace spinal surgery or uh, treatment of intervertebral disc disease uh, with hyperbaric oxygen, but I think putting the two together, I, I know based on just some of the data that we've collected that we see uh, a significant uh, improvement in how fast they return back to ambulation, how quickly they urinate, and as it relates to deep pain, positive or negative dogs, we actually see a higher percentage of deep negative dogs return back to ambulation than we did before we were using it. It's about 78% uh, at this point. We're still collecting numbers on that, but that's much better than the typical 50-50 that we uh, typically would quote uh, for an intervertebral disc dog with no pain sensation. I don't believe it's, it's really considered alternative or holistic. It's we are using oxygen as a drug just like we would use any other drug. We are prescribing this uh, for a certain amount of time at a certain pressure and at a certain percentage of oxygen that we're breathing. And I do believe that uh, a lot of the treatments that we do have to be very dose dependent. Um, for instance, I will tell you that chronic neurological problems respond much better to multiple lower pressure hyperbaric oxygen treatments than an acute head trauma uh, that I would treat maybe at a higher pressure. Um, so dosing is very important in how we, we treat these patients and that's, that's part of the trick and that's part of what we have to kind of figure out as we go along. 60 years of research and science, the Navy and the Air Force has done an enormous amount of studies. And while we don't have a lot of veterinary studies specifically, a lot of these studies that were used were either dogs, rabbits, um, or rats. And so a lot of the studies that were performed where they looked at how it prevents reperfusion injury and inflammation, that was actually done on dog test models. And, you know, frankly, I, I'm a big believer in, in uh, dogs, you know, they, we hate to see them used for research, but what I would say is a lot of animals lost their life in the name of science, but they, they really pushed forward and showed a lot of differences and a lot of improvements uh, in the using hyperbaric medicine for our patients. So, um, 
you know, it's, it's, they definitely, uh, a lot of lives have been given for that. I did a Google Scholar search uh, not very long ago, and you can see the number of papers that pop up on different topics. Now, what we would like to see is um, we have to infer a lot of that material from the human side. Um, the good news is, is that the physiology of how hyperbaric medicine works is really the same, whether you're a dog, cat, llama, doesn't really matter. Um, so I feel like we can infer a lot of the information and I feel like a lot of it does actually transfer over and, and vice versa. As, as we uh, use hyperbaric medicine more commonly, I think we're going to see studies that may lead to the human side using it in the more acute phases of things. So we really have a good, good reason to collaborate and uh, build on the, the whole process for both human and animal patients. So let's talk a little bit about just regular air that we breathe. Um, some of you may or may not know, we, we are breathing 21% oxygen and about 78% nitrogen. Um, and here in New Orleans or in Louisiana, we are definitely at sea level, if not a little bit below sea level. Um, if you live in Colorado or somewhere, you might be very high up and have more altitude to where you live. But essentially at sea level, we are under one ATA of pressure, which is 14.7 millimeters of mercury. That's how much pressure between the atmosphere and where we are is being placed on our bodies. So even just sitting here, we're at 14.7 millimeters of mercury. And when we're breathing, if we're healthy and we don't have any type of uh, pulmonary issues, we should have our hemoglobin saturated at 98 to 100%, okay? So approximately 98% of the, the oxygen that's carried in the body is carried on hemoglobin in the red blood cells. About 2% is in the plasma, so it's not very much. And the problem is, is no matter how much oxygen we give at a normal pressure, we're still only going to be at 98 to 100%. That hemoglobin has four spots and it can't carry any more oxygen in a, in a normal, healthy patient. So if I went and put a hundred percent oxygen mask on my face right now, and I had a pulse ox, I'd still be 98 to hundred percent. I can't put any more. So people would say, well, why do we use supplemental oxygen? Well, we do because a lot of times those patients have some sort of pulmonary uh, abnormality or poor circulation or another reason why they're not carrying oxygen. And that would be the reason for using 100% oxygen on the mask. But just to give it at this rate, we wouldn't be able to carry any more oxygen in our blood if we're just sitting here at a, a normal pressure or at sea level. So when we use oxygen as a drug, we are increasing how much oxygen we breathe. For our patients, it's typically 100%. Um, we are also increasing the pressure. So in the typical animal patient that could be anywhere from a half to a full ATA, maybe even a little more depending on what we're pressure, what we're, what we're uh, treating. And then the time, how long do we treat that? Because that definitely affects how much oxygen gets pushed into the blood. So when we pressurize these patients and they're breathing 100% oxygen, as you can see from this picture, not only does the hemoglobin pick up all the oxygen that it normally would, then, I'm sorry, it's 14.7 PSI. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Yeah, it's 760 millimeters of mercury. You're correct. 14.7 um, PSI is what 1 ATA is. Um, but if we push oxygen actually into the, the, the bloodstream itself under pressure, you can see that the hemoglobin is already taken up. And you can also see that now we have a lot more oxygen pushed into the plasma itself. And so now we have a huge uh, uh, concentration gradient where we are able to push oxygen to those, to those weaker tissues or those tissues that don't have a normal oxygenation. So this just gives you some ideas of, of kind of what to expect in terms of uh, pressure and depth. So at, at sea level, like we said, we are at 
14.7 PSI. Uh, somebody caught that. I said that wrong, but it's, it's 760 millimeters of mercury. But 14.7 PSI is the pressure that we're under at that. Once we go to one ATA, which is about the equivalent of going about 33 feet below the water, uh, that takes us to almost 30 PSI, and, and that's typically kind of the range that we would stop at in animal patients. Some people will go a little bit higher for certain indications, but for the most part, we're treating somewhere between 1.5 and, and 2. So when we do this diffusion, because of Graham's law and the concentration gradient of going from uh, a high concentration to a low concentration, we're actually able to diffuse out into those tissues four times further than what we typically do. Um, and, and so for a wound that's compromised or a diabetic foot ulcer or a burn wound, somewhere where there's not a good vascular supply, it allows us to push oxygen out into even the plasma or the, the, the fluid surrounding that tissue like CSF um, and get to those compromised tissues. This is just a little, uh, you don't have to memorize this, this formula, everything, but it's, it's a nice formula because it kind of gives you an idea of, of how much you can increase the amount of oxygen or the PaO2 for, for a patient. Um, as you can see, when we're at sea level with 21%, we should have about 100 uh, millimeters of mercury for a PaO2. That's pretty typical. And as we start to pressurize and put these patients uh, at 100% oxygen and under pressure, you can see how those numbers jump very quickly. At, at 3 ATA, we are almost 20 times what the normal uh, PaO2 should be. So uh, you can get a significant increase and a, a huge gradient going by adding in oxygen. And really, you can use this uh, this formula to figure out anything. I personally have a, a mild hyperbaric chamber that I breathe uh, through a oxygen generator. And of course, my oxygen is not 100%. It's probably closer to 90. But using this, I can kind of get an idea of what my PaO2 would be based on the pressures that, that I treat myself at. So let's talk a little bit about the, the benefits that we see. And, and for me, as a as a surgeon, uh, treating the swelling and edema is, is, a, is a huge part of things. Um, what we've seen is when we treat with hyperbarics, both preoperatively and postoperatively, we, we get much less swelling, edema, and probably secondarily, the, the patients seem more, more comfortable. And I can document that just based on doing gait analysis with a gait four system. They tend to put more pressure on the leg earlier on, and we just we don't see the typical swelling and edema that we would appreciate with a with a TPLO. Now the key is I think again pre-treating those patients, treating before, and then treating them also in in the in the post-operative period. But when we're dealing with uh, with swelling and edema, the reason this works is hyperbaric oxygen. It's kind of counterintuitive. It actually causes massive vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction keeps the fluid and the proteins from leaking out into the, the, the tissues themselves. So not only do you have less uh, endothelial permeability, but you also have increased lymphatic flow and then less inflammation associated with it. So that's, that's one of the things that we see a big difference from. And whether it's a postoperative patient, I think... Um, you know, a snake, a snake bite patient. That's another one that we see a lot. We had one in here just a couple of days ago as a water moccasin bite, severe swelling. And, and just a couple of treatments in the chamber, we are able to pull a lot of that swelling edema down, which allows us to get oxygen to those compromised tissues uh, in those cases. But that's, that's a, a, a big benefit, um, especially for me in, in, a, in a surgical practice to see that. The other thing is, is if you think about intervertebral disc dogs, um, there is a basically a concussive portion of the injury and there is a compressive portion of the injury. And so with surgery, we deal with the compressive part and with hyperbarics, we're able to treat with the concussive part, the swelling, the edema in the cord, the reperfusion injury that that could be occurring because of being compressed for a certain period of time. And I do believe intervertebral disc disease definitely is a form of compartmentalization where we're within a vertebral body, we have something pushing on the cord 
It's blocking the blood flow. It's blocking oxygenation to very sensitive tissues. And when we decompress them, we are resuming blood flow back to that, to that tissue. And so as a result, there can be uh, pretty significant injuries to the cord. That's why uh, in these really severe cases or these cases where pain sensation is present but diminished, I think uh, that's where hyperbaric oxygen really plays a big role in getting those patients uh, to move forward in the, in the process and get better. Significant decreases in the inflammatory response. And if a lot of you guys may remember from um, early on in vet school, the, uh, the margination process of, of neutrophils, but basically when there's an injury to the tissue, there are little flags essentially on the neutrophil and on the endothelium. And those little flags are they're, they're what they refer to as ICAM receptors. They're, they're little small proteins and if those proteins link up between the endothelium and the neutrophil itself, they start to kind of congregate and, and, and form a white blood cell clot, so to say. And as that forms, it decreases the blood flow. And then those white blood cells are able to kind of exude out into the affected tissue and release in, uh, all their cytotoxic granules and, and do what they do. Interestingly, though, if if uh, we treat, especially pre-treat with hyperbaric oxygen, a lot of that process is inhibited. And so we don't have as much issue with reperfusion injury and white blood cell migration because essentially hyperbaric oxygen shuts off the genes that cause those little flags to pop up and, and show their face. So if those flags are not present, the neutrophils don't, don't uh, form that clot at the tissue injury. And so we prevent any further uh, migration of white blood cells into the tissues. And that's really where uh, the whole epigenetic part comes to this. And, you know, we've known for a long time that we see these benefits. So we see these wounds get better, they get healed. We all these different benefits to doing hyperbarics. But for a long time, nobody knew why. They couldn't really explain it. They didn't have a good understanding of it. Well, now we know um, from a study done probably uh, about eight or nine years ago that there are 8,001 genes that are either upregulated or downregulated in, in when hyperbaric oxygen is, is used. And I do think that, uh, you know, whether or not these uh, genes turn on or off is very dose dependent. And so what we see is for a lot of the genes that code for growth and repair, they go up, they turn on. And for the ones that call for inflammation and cell death and reperfusion injury, they turn off. And they've actually documented these inflammatory mediators turning on and off uh, in, these, in these patients in both endothelial cells and some animal cells. So here's just a list. You don't have to memorize these, but it's kind of a good list to show you that some of the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines that get downregulated when we use hyperbaric oxygen and also the anti-inflammatory cytokines that, that occur uh, that turn on or upregulate when we're, we're treating these guys. I always think this is pretty interesting. This is from a, a a doctor in Australia, Mal Hooper, who's very much into hyperbaric medicine, but he does cytokine panels. He works with a lot of um, uh, elite athletes. And this panel on the left that you see over here, this is actually from a, a stroke patient. And so you can see how many of these uh, cytokines, he calls it the cytokine storm, are very, very elevated in this process. And then if you look to the next site, this is that same stroke victim one hour after having a hyperbaric oxygen treatment. And you can see how many of those cytokines return back to normal levels or are significantly decreased. And again, I think this is a, a real testament to how we're able to uh, really block that cytokine storm and block that reperfusion injury that occurs in these patients. So 
ischemia reperfusion injury, it's sometimes a, um, a hard concept for people to, to understand. It is a very complex process, but essentially uh, what people should think about when they think about reperfusion injury is uh, a heart attack. Uh, that's a great example. So you have a coronary vessel that becomes obstructed. You go to the doctor, they do a stent, blood flow is resumed, but there is issues with myocardial damage secondary to the blood returning back to that ischemic tissue. And that's what the oxygen paradox is, is there's really two. You would think that when you have a tissue that is ischemic and doesn't have a good blood supply and it needs oxygen, that if you resume oxygen to that tissue, that it would be good for it, right? I mean, that's just kind of intuitive, but the, the truth of the matter is it's actually not good for it and that it actually causes a lot of margination of those neutrophils, sets off an inflammatory cascade, and that's where myocardial damage occurs. Same thing with a stroke, the same thing with a free flap that we might do in an animal patient, same thing that might occur in the stomach with a GDV or in a spinal cord that's been compressed for several days. Um, so that reperfusion injury uh, has actually been shown that if they give deoxygenated blood back to that tissue, it's actually better for it than oxygenated blood. So that makes you think, well, then if I give hyperbaric oxygen, which is even more oxygen, then it should be really bad for the tissue. But that's paradox number two. And what we found is that hyperbaric oxygen given to a, a tissue that has had a reperfusion injury actually prevents the reperfusion process and injury, blocks the neutrophil marginiza marginization and the tissue damage to those, um, to whatever tissue might be affected. And what's interesting in, in a lot of, uh, in human hospitals now, you know, they may have oxygen on you initially when you're on the way to the hospital, but as soon as they realize that you're respiratory system is okay, they actually take that oxygen away because we know that 100% uh, oxygen could potentially be actually harmful to a tissue. You're adding fuel to the fire. Um, and so they will take you off of oxygen very quickly if you don't need it versus um, what we would do is, is we would treat that patient with 100% oxygen and we would reduce that in, inflammatory um, and reperfusion injury to, to whatever that tissue is. So that's the two oxygen paradoxes. And the, the, the first, again, being that oxygenated blood going to a tissue that is ischemic can actually cause more damage. But oxygen paradox two, oxygen, 100% oxygen under pressure will actually reduce the reperfusion injury. So it's, it's pretty interesting that it, how it works. And again, with reperfusion injury, what we're talking about is those free radicals or the reactive oxygen species that work on the cell wall and call cause tissue damage. Those are the things they actually kind of result in a chain reaction until there's a, a termination of that, that injury. And, and hyperbaric oxygen, that's one of the ways that it works is it blocks that chain reaction and, and causes the terminal reaction to, to end, but also through the result of, of producing lots of antioxidants, catalase, super, superoxide demutase, all of these help soak up those extra radicals that are causing damage and prevent um, the, the tissue damage. And again, I, I think for and Dr. Harch and I, and Dr. Harch is a, a very uh, famous human uh, hyperbaric specialist that, that's out there. and. We've, we've talked about it, that that's probably one of the reasons why the pretreatment works so well is where we're, we're preventing uh, that reperfusion injury and that inflammatory cascade, even for some of the, the most simplest of, of injuries. Um, also, hyperbarics has been shown uh, in people to increase the, uh, the circulating amount of uh, CD34 stem cells, which probably plays a significant role in the healing process of how it works. Um, more stem cells that are out there in circulation and being produced by the bone marrow, then the more that potentially can, can reach that tissue. And uh, you know, hopefully this summer we'll be working on a study with my intern that we're going to look at that uh, in, in dogs as well and see what kind of uh, increases are out there. It's been proposed that 
with with two to three treatments, we see about three times increase in, in stem cells in dogs. So um, it'll be interesting to see what, what we find on that study. Certainly helps prevent infection. Um, bringing new blood vessels to an infected tissue, whether that be osteomyelitis or uh, the bones or anything like that, uh, is definitely activated by having periods of hyperoxia and hypoxia. That's what stimulates those blood vessels to come in. We also know that the, the white blood cells need oxygen to have their oxidative burst and, and kill the bacteria. And for things like costridial infections, which we do sometimes see, especially uh, in the horse world, um, the hyperbaric oxygen will essentially stop the alpha toxin uh, in clostridium and prevent it from, from occurring. So uh, in people and, and in animals, we would, we would want to treat and remove all of the affected infected tissue and then treat with hyperbaric oxygen um, till that infection is, is overcome. We also know that, that antibiotics are actually synergistic when used with, with uh, hyperbaric medicine, especially the fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides. And we've definitely seen um, really good use for things like discospondylitis or uh, osteomyelitis using amikacin and, and hyperbarics together. Uh, we've cleared those infections fairly rapidly. So some of the ways that it, it potentiates antibiotic is it does affect the bacterial DNA and RNA, but probably the, the primary is, is producing that oxidative burst that neutrophils need to, to kill the bacteria. And certainly we do improve uh, perfusion by bringing in new blood vessels through hyperbarics for those. And like I said, uh, the aminoglycosides are, are probably the ones that we see the biggest effect on. And then uh, if we have oncologists that are out there, certainly um, dealing with uh, poor blood supply to bladders or to bone because of radiation or non-healing wounds in cats. Again, the neoangiogenesis that occurs with hyperbaric oxygen from periods of hypoxia and hyperoxia helps bring new blood vessels to that. It's, it's not something we commonly seen, but in, in people that have had radiation, they, they tend to get osteoradionecrosis several years down the road. And one of the ways that they improve the vascular volume of that bone is, is through using multiple treatments of hyperbaric oxygen. Again, going back to perfusion, uh, this is not something that we typically use in, in the veterinary side, but it's something that Dr. Hart uses all the time with his primary focus being on the brain. Um, essentially, the, uh, these spec scans allow us to give a radioisotope that essentially measures how much blood flow is occurring in the brain. And so it's a great objective way to show the differences in patients that have had a traumatic brain injury um, and improvement in their blood flow. And this, this happens to be a, a kid that had a, a bad right frontal lobe injury right in here. And you can see how there's, there's just not a lot of symmetry to the scan. Um, and then this is, this is 40 treatments later. Um, he's got a, you know more normal blood flow, more, better perfusion to the brain. And, and this dog, or this guy uh, actually went on to um, be fairly functional. He did have some cognitive abnormalities, but um, was significantly improved from where he was discharged. So let's talk about the FDA approved uses in the US. And this is always kind of a stickler for me. These are the things that basically the FDA has approved for insurance reimbursement. Okay, and that's, that's a big, important thing to understand that we're not talking about what it can actually treat and do. We're talking about what the FDA will, and the insurance companies will pay for. And so, you know, you see a lot of the air gas embolism, uh, necrotizing soft tissue injuries, radiation injury, compromised skin graft, uh, refractory osteomyelitis, which always makes me laugh because that means they've treated the osteomyelitis and have had no success so now they're adding hyperbaric oxygen which why wouldn't you just do it in the first place um so these are all the things that the fda approves now if you go anywhere else in the world you will see that there are 
probably 100 to 120, depending on what country you go to, uh, approved uses for hyperbaric oxygen. Russia, China, Germany, and boy, Israel. Um, Israel has done an enormous amount of uh, hyperbaric research looking at both traumatic brain injury and stroke and using stem cells in uh, regenerative medicine associated with it. Um, really a great body of work over there that they're working on. But you can see there's a whole long list of other treatments. And, and I think that's what we're seeing in, in veterinary patients is that there's a lot of things that we could potentially you know, treat and use this for. I laughed the other day because I had a lady come in with uh, a cat that had feline lower urinary tract disease. And she said, look, I've been to two internists. I've done every treatment under the book. They've put, uh, you know, they've infused the bladder. They've done bladder flushes. They've done cultures. They've done everything. They've treated her with every remedy. And she just couldn't get any relief. And she said, do you think hyperbaric oxygen would help? And I told her, I have no, no idea whatsoever. Um, there's certainly not... Uh, any information out there about that, but we treated the cat. And amazingly, after five treatments, uh, the stranguria went away, the palacuria went away, that cat was able to urinate with no blood. And, and she said, this was the first time in two years. And now the cat comes in, he's 21 years old, he comes in once a week and has a, a dive. And she said, again, for the first time in, you know, almost two years, of, of treatment, this cat finally has some relief. So we never really know until we kind of try some of these things and, and see. So obviously um, there may be a lot of different things that we can treat, inflammatory bowel disease, pancreatitis, GDV, all these different things that, that might be available to us. And one of the big issues that you know comes up with, with these hyperbaric treatments is that they want FDA studies in the human side for the insurance to pay for it. And again, you can't patent oxygen, so a lot of people don't want to put big dollars into these research studies for this. Um, but, you know, again, veterinarians, we have the opportunity to kind of lead the way on some of these other, other treatment modalities. So for me, people always say, well, what do I treat with that? And, you know, I think, I think the best answer is if it causes hypoxia, ischemia, inflammation, or reperfusion injury, there's going to be some benefit to it. Um, and, and so that's kind of how we base, how we treat our patients. Um, pretty much all of our spinal, uh, injuries will have pre and post hyperbarics. A lot of our orthopedic patients, um, especially if they come in with a fracture and it looks like the old turkey leg, it's giant and swollen. There's probably some level of compartmentalization. A couple of treatments in the chamber will bring that swelling and edema down significantly. Um, so there's, there's a whole long list of of potentials and what's what's been talked about in in uh, in veterinary patients. So again, there here's a list. FCE um, we've found a much more rapid uh, improvement in neurological status, faster return to recovery in our FCE patients that we treat with hyperbaric oxygen. If we treat them acutely and immediately, most of those dogs are getting up and walking out of the hospital at four to five days post and we run them twice a day. Spinal cord injury, fractures, we talked about that. Acute head traumas, um, it's been, I literally sent a, a case to LSU and had, had treated it twice uh, for head trauma and was sending it there for overnight uh, at the ICU and the neurologist and the dog was almost essentially normal by the time it got to uh, LSU to, for evaluation. Um, cerebral ischemia or stroke, it's something we're identifying a lot more now that we have MRI in dogs. Um, I've had two, two cases from Mississippi State that were basically, you know, written off as this is what you need to get used to. These were dogs that weren't able to walk, had severe head tilts and severe dysfunction. And in doing multiple hyperbaric treatments and rehabilitation, we had these patients up walking and, and functioning again um, for a patient that you know, was essentially said nothing could be done. Discospondylitis is another biggie. Um, fractures and compartment uh, syndrome. If, if we have any internists with us, ileus and pancreatitis. Pancreatitis can make a huge difference, um, in, especially in those, those dogs that have intractable uh, 
vomiting and, and pain in the belly, we found that with one to two treatments, the, the vomiting will stop. Um, again, if we think about pancreatitis, it's essentially a reperfu reperfusion injury to a very uh, angry uh, pancreatic organ. Uh, skin flow, if you have these um, you know, flaps where the tip of the flap is, is not looking so hot and you're worried about it, which happens you know, sometimes in surgery, um, we will treat those guys and a lot of times we can salvage the flap, snake and spider bites. There's a great study, <coughs> excuse me, great study being done at UT where they're looking at, at snake bites. So hopefully we'll get some information from them before long. Carbon monoxide, I let all of the firefighters in the area know that we have a chamber in case it's a house fire because uh, certainly there are pets that get trapped in, in fires. Shock, hypotension, and you know the one I don't have on here is CPR. I've had uh, uh, literally in the, about three days ago, we had a septic peritonitis pup that uh, arrested twice within about a 10 minute period we were able to resuscitate the pup twice. And, you know, when we recovered it the second time, we really didn't have a whole lot going on upstairs. The, the pup was breathing on its own, but no palpebral, poor pupillary light response. Um, we put it in the chamber and we ran it up really high because this is a classic global ischemia case. And when the dog came out, it was visual looking around, lucid, um, it was pretty amazing. And, and this little guy actually ended up surviving and, and going on to uh, survive his, his bad septic peritonitis. Uh, so pretty, pretty impressive case for that one. It was pretty, pretty neat to watch. Septic arthritis, Lyme's disease is something certainly in people. Uh, we know that hyperbaric oxygen essentially blocks the, the Lyme bacteria. So a lot of people are, are taking that for that. Um, intracranial abscesses and peritonitis are all certainly things that we see. So again, I think the point of this is that we have multiple things that we can treat and we don't have the restrictions that they have in human medicine. We're actually able to treat these patients on an acute basis versus, you know, a month down the road after the injury is said and done. And so now what we need is, and I, I'm a big proponent of getting hyperbaric chambers into the universities where the forefront of the research can occur so we can start showing some of these benefits because I see them day in, day out, but we need to be able to demonstrate that to people because, again, people like to see the, the studies when they're out there. So how many treatments do we end up typically doing in, in these patients? Um, I, you know, I would say in the typical dog, three to five sometimes if it's something more involved we'll go 10 to 20 depends on the case uh, the stroke victims we did you know blocks of 10 and we we typically don't have to do as many as what you would see in people probably because of cellular turnover in animal patients versus people uh, but you know in in most cases we're looking at, at anywhere from three to ten depending on it and, and what's been really surprising is one of the things that I worried about most when we brought this into the practice is our clients going to be on board with it. Um, you know, it's, as we all know, sometimes it's hard enough to, to get them to do the surgery or to do the rehab. Um, what I found is that most of these clients are asking me, is my dog going to get hyperbaric oxygen? So it, it's been amazing. I would say probably 90% of our orthopedic patients undergo preconditioning hyperbarics uh, pre and post surgery. They're very happy with it. Many of them have had surgery with us before when we didn't have hyperbarics and they're like, man, it's just such a dramatic difference. So the, the differences are there. Um, we just have to figure out ways to document them and, and show everybody our, our benefits. Just a couple of references to wrap up here. Um, if you're interested in hyperbarics, I, I highly recommend the Oxygen Revolution written by Dr. Harch. This is a, um, is, a, is a great book that talks about a lot of the gene therapy that we're seeing and um, a lot of the different things that he's treating on the human side in terms of uh, stroke and traumatic brain injury. And, He's actually got a study now that is probably going to pave the way for traumatic brain injury to be paid for by insurance. Um, and I think that's 
that's going to be a, a biggie. Uh, the book on the left is also a very good textbook, the physiology and, and medicine book over on your left. But if I had to recommend one to anybody, textbook of hyperbaric medicine is probably the best. It has a, a great, concise uh, chapters that cover just about every topic, and they have all the research um, listed behind it. So it's kind of an easier way than trying to go down and and uh, tr track it down. But I, I think uh, these are great books that, that you could try. A couple of uh, resources to, just to let you guys know, you, you can become a certified hyperbaric technician uh, through the uh, National Board of Diving and Hyperbaric Technology. Uh, myself and several techs have gone through this. It's a good course. It's about a week and then you take an exam. Um, it's a great way to learn about some of the safety associated with hyperbarics. And then uh, I do recommend the, the Veterinary Hyperbaric Medicine Society. That's going to be growing and probably be become a part of um, the Hyperbaric Medicine International, which is, um, is a new combining of a couple of groups. And the great thing about this, if you've seen on the vet forum page, uh, they are going to have a subcommittee that is just for veterinarians. They're going to have somewhere between six and eight hours of veterinary specific uh, CE involved with that. So it'll be a great collaboration group to, to come to um, with multiple groups. And if you're going to be out, uh, the Seacrest guys will be at all these different meetings. Um, I'll be at a few of these. Hopefully we'll get to meet and actually uh, you know, see a chamber and kind of see what what's involved with it. So with that, I will leave any questions. Um, if anybody has anything, I know a lot of you are already doing hyperbarics in your practice, and I think that's great. Um, I'll field a couple of questions here. If people type in the uh, chat box, I'm sorry if we had some sound issues. I'm not sure what that was about, but um, hopefully on the recording, you'll be able to see it. We, we should be able to put this up on YouTube as well once we get set and, and done with everything. Any questions from anybody? So, yeah, that's, that's a... a a great question about the the question is is what is the consensus on using oxygen therapy and uh, hyperbarics for for heat stroke? Um, I think that's a great question. I and I would say 100%. It's a uh, it would be great to use because you're right. Some of the GI effects, cardiac effects, brain effects. Um, hyperbaric oxygen is going to block a lot of that inflammatory response. So especially if we can treat them early and also treat by making sure that their vascular volume is, is treated appropriately um, so that they can carry that oxygen to those tissues. It'd be a, a great treatment modality. Um, so I have a question here for for intervertebral disc disease suspected patients, are you pre-treating with HBOT prior to the MRI plus or minus surgery? So typically um, they have their CT evaluation first or their MRI. And once we have a definitive diagnosis, then they would go into the hyperbarics um, for a pre-treatment. But yes, they definitely, we, we wanna treat them before. And I've done it both ways. Um, we've treated them in the, in the process of uh, treating them just after and also treating them before. And we definitely see a big improvement when we treat them prior to. So uh, I think I think that's going to be the one of the big keys. And, and Dr. Harch is a big proponent of that as well. Let's see. I would be careful in treating a cat. They, uh, somebody had made a comment about a cat with arthritis and the cat has asthma. You have to be really careful about those patients because again, they can have air trapping. And uh, I, I would be cautious about uh, putting that patient in the hyperbaric chamber. And if I did, I would run him at very, very low pressures because again, 
Um, you have to worry about air being trapped in those sacks and potentially you could have a, a bulla or a rupture of, of, of the avioli. Yeah, you could do hyperbarics before your imaging and contrast. Um, you know, the only reason that we don't usually is because we're just trying to make sure we have a definitive diagnosis. Um, you know, if it's a patient that, that doesn't necessarily have a disc, um, you know, we can decide how we're going to treat from there. But yeah, there would be nothing wrong with treating them prior to contrast. Um, I would say a half a ATA on a cat. Um, but I, I would be, I would be really careful about treating the cat with asthma. Okay. Another question was, I'm trying to get through all these. I'm sorry that they're, they're kind of like scrolling through. Have you heard of concerns of placing patients with skin staples in the chamber? I always thought the patient could only have skin seizures. No, we use, we have patients with um, skin staples all the time. That's that's not an issue. Um, typically, what we do is if there is anything metal, you wrap it in cotton just to prevent any uh, you know metal on metal. But um, I think you would be fine. We have a dog in the hospital now. They got a gun off a countertop and it discharged. It looks like the entry wound is on. Oh, I lost it. On the left ear, we assume there's, every time I get to read it, it clicks off. Um, so the dog with, that got, had the gunshot, I think, think that you would probably want to CT that dog and, and see. Um, that's a tough one. I'm not really sure. I mean, it's, I guess it's possible you could have air trapping in the sinus, but if it's traumatized, it probably there's air leaking out of it anyway. So it would be able to uh, be able to treat it. How long are the typical treatment sessions? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, some people will treat an hour. Um, I, it typically is just um, dependent on what we're treating. So for a lot of my orthopedic stuff, um, it's typically 30, 35 minutes. For some of my neuro stuff, it's typically 40, 45. Good to see you on here, Dr. Way. Yeah, really good question. Um, Hang on just a second. I'm trying to get to everybody's questions here. Um, the question, there was a question on there. Do we have any concerns about using hyperbarics with neoplastic disease? And in the past, definitely people were concerned about that. Most of the studies out of Russia show that there is uh, no detriment to the cancer itself. In fact, the truth is most tumors are hypoxic, and so they don't like the oxygen. And the um, hyperbaric oxygen will actually sensitize them to both radiation and chemo treatment. In fact, in, in people, it's used quite a bit, especially uh, for prostatic surgery and things like that. Let's see. Hip lux. Sorry, it's really hard to keep up with these because every time it, uh, I start to read it, it pops up to the top. Let me see what we had. I saw something about a hip luxation. Hit by car, pelvic fractures, hip luxation, hoping to reduce the hip, stable enough supporter with assistance. Uh, minimally to switch out to it. 
yeah, so I would definitely be treating um, pelvic fractures or injuries like that with hyperbaric oxygen just from the standpoint of swelling and edema. Um, I've also had some patients that had a pretty nasty sciatic neuropraxia, and uh, I think it probably helped with that as well. So, yeah, I would. I think trauma cases are are very suitable for this, especially before surgery. All right. Well, I guess if anybody else has questions, you're always welcome to to email me. Um, my email is r h a n c o c k zero four one four at yahoo.com. Um, I'm always happy to uh, answer any questions. Oh, wait, I got one more here from uh, Jay. Have you ever put a geisha number? No, I don't see a lot of birds, but yes, you definitely can put birds in it. In fact, there's a funny story that uh, one of the other doctors told me about. They were treating a, uh, a hawk with some sort of aspergillosis and it literally came in on its deathbed, was laterally recumbent and couldn't move and just almost dead. So they put it in the chamber. And the, the funny part of the story is when they opened the chamber, the, the, that hawk came out, fired up mad with, with talons out and was uh, definitely feeling better after his hyperbaric treatment. So, yeah, we, we definitely can treat uh, birds. We've also treated sea turtles. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of stuff we could be looking at in terms of different species. Thank you guys. I appreciate y'all spending the hour with us. I had fun. We'll, we're going to do some more uh, in the future. Uh, we'll, we'll have some different topics, maybe some case studies, maybe some safety about hyperbarics, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll get you guys back. Uh, I appreciate all of you. If anybody has any interest in, in hyperbarics or chamber and wants to discuss it with me, you're always free to email me. Uh, again, R-H-A-N-C-O-C-K-0414 at yahoo.com. Um, I'm always happy to call and talk about it and, uh, and help out. Y'all have a great evening and thank you.